I'm Julianne Good, and this is Psych One on One. Welcome. We are here to make psychology more understandable with tips for you and your family to make your lives easier. How are you doing tonight? Yeah, that's the question for the evening. How are you really truly doing? Tonight, my special guest is Jose Trujillo, and we are going to be talking about Hispanic mental health and all the different aspects that go along. So if you would like to participate in this conversation at any point, please give us a call, 800-893-9562. We would love to hear from you. And Jose, hi, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing excellent. <laughs> <laughs> excellent. Well, I'm very happy and excited to join you here in this wonderful, wonderful studio. I mean, this, as soon as I walked in, I felt like I was at home because it kind of looked like my home. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have yeah. to talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jose, um, can you give us a little bit about your background in psychology? Sure. I started as um, uh, I started with my bachelor's of arts from Cal State uh, in Los Angeles. And uh, I moved on from there to UCI and I get a master's um, in also in psychology, uh, master's of arts from UCI. And, then, and now I'm currently involved in business, DBA, uh, doing a DBA, Doctor of Business Administration uh, in RC University. So, yeah. Yep. Good for you. That's a smart move. <laughs> Psychology and business, it can't go wrong with that combination. Absolutely not. They go together. Actually. Yes, definitely. So can you tell us a little bit about your background? It's very interesting. We've we've had discussions back and forth about your childhood and how you got into psychology, and I, I think it's really interesting. Yes, and I came uh, to this country when I was about uh, 15 years old. I was um, uh, monolingual in Spanish. So uh, I did the first year, started the first year in high school, and uh, it was a challenge because I had no background in the uh, wonderful English language. So it took me, uh, took me aback. Uh, there was a lot of issues, of course, uh, changing, moving, acculturation, um, of course, the language factor, and um, also some of the issues from, uh, in the psychological point of view such as um, had behavior problems. It was a bad area too. So um, there were uh, definitely, um, I wish I had known about psychology back then. Because then I would have uh, at least uh, would have been more self-reflective uh, mm. about my own actions. Yeah. And where did you move from at age 15? Um, I was born in uh, Guadalajara, Jalisco, uh, Mexico. Uh, it's about an hour from Puerto Vallarta, if you know that, where mm -hmm. that is. Mm -hmm. um, I came here when I was around 15. So I had my uh, secondary education in Mexico. So I know how to write and, and read well in Spanish. And uh, my mother was already here in the United States. We were at the time living with uh, my grandparents. So um, she came for us uh, to the United States uh, in 1990. <laughs> back in that. <laughs> yeah, it's way back. Um, and then we tried to be a family again. So my mother, my sister, and myself. Yeah. So can you talk about uh, a little bit of how that was leaving your birthplace for a country that you didn't know what was going to happen here and the, some of the um, challenges that you went through. Sure. During um, the period. Um, I was surprised when I, uh, when I first came to the United States, of course, I was, um, I was 15 years old. I was full of hormones and craziness that happens during adolescence. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it was a time of high stress, um, leaving your friends, family behind, and then coming to a strange place. And um, uh, curiously, when I started going to high school here, I found out that a lot of people were in my, in my situation. Mm 
a lot of the students um, who I uh, contacted and spent time with, and especially in the first two years of high school, were in very similar situations um, as mine, um, often single-parent households, um, histories of um, abuse, um, violent situations, uh, and, and then coming here and not knowing the language. It was, uh, it, uh, it, I, I was surprised by the number of people that were in, in that type of um, situation. You know? So did yeah. that make the transition a little bit easier maybe then because you felt like okay, uh, we've got something similar happening here so that we can support each other. Right. That was probably the thing that most of the kids during that time or during that uh, period of time uh, have in common. They have each other as common. And it's not surprising that building that type of uh, peer relationship uh, with other people like... like that like the same things that you do, uh, dress the same way that you do, find common things. Uh, it's not surprising that they stick together, and um, oftentimes they're in in dangerous situations, you know, dangerous neighborhoods. So they go to the uh, to the dark side. They go to the wrong side. Yeah. So uh, where yeah. where did you move to over here? Did you move right into L.A.? Well, I I landed in in uh, sound, uh, South Central. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that was my home when I first came in. So there was that was definitely um, uh, a culture shock. <laughs> never has seen, never in my life had I seen a African American or a black person before. Mm-hmm. So um, living in in during that time, it was a time of high tri- high crime. Mm-hmm. Um, remember that the riots started right around Florence and Normandy. I lived about a block away. Wow. Yes. So um, I, I was in the middle of it. <clears throat> oh, so how long were you in uh, South Central before the riots started happening? Uh, 1990. Oh. Yeah. You were right on the edge of it. Wow. Yeah. And Nothing riots like a welcome occurred. to America, huh? Yeah. Yeah. And the riots yeah. occurred. I, if I remember, uh, if Sublime, um, you know, the group is yes. correct, is April 1992. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. Wow, that is that's yeah. that's quite a shocking uh, way to come in. Yeah, but then again, um, you have that small uh, uh, support system in in the people who are in similar situation as you are. So uh, you go and um, you try to make friends that way. And of course, uh, it's some of the country, some of the culture. So it's a it's an extra challenge for people like myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I would imagine. Now, are you close to your family? Uh, traditionally, uh, well, this is my opinion, of course, but uh, uh, traditionally uh, Mexican-American families have been really close, mm-hmm. um, have a close-knit um, family ties between, right between each other to help each other out. Uh, I am very close. Uh, I, um, I used to be very, very close to my mother. Single parent household again. Never uh, really met my dad until about uh, when I was thirty seven. Believe it or not, first time that I ever saw my dad, and uh, or any anyone from my father's side of the family. So that was really interesting to see. Did you meet experience? I bet. Did you meet him here or down in Mexico? Down in Mexico, he has a small business. He Mm -hmm. makes shoes and is also interested uh, i was surprised to to find out as we talked more and more uh, he's really interested in in philosophy psychology and in fact has a few books in spanish of oh, the same books that i have really how yeah. fascinating right wow i bet you that just kind of made you go Oh, did you ever wonder how you ended up getting interested in psychology? Was it? You know, I never wondered. I mean, I, the, it, it was, I was really surprised when I, we, my my dad and I, my father and I had the same interests. So um, that really, what he liked, didn't like, n- never crossed my mind, you know. 
So it's really surprising, and I want to find out, okay, how much genetics is playing on, on, on my own behavior uh, without me even being aware mm-hmm. that I'm doing it. Yeah. yeah, but I bet with having to go through such a major cultural change at 15, you, what, you would have had to get that natural awareness and watching people's behaviors and trying to figure out what are they going to do next, especially if there was like a, a language barrier. So is that when it really, your interest in psychology and sociology and oh, anthropology yeah. started kicking in? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I think it was from uh, very early on, um, uh, when I, uh, in terms of time, I remember being five, six years old and asking different questions about human behavior. Hey, where is this coming from? Or why is that person doing that? Uh, how come I don't have a dad and you do? Mm-hmm. You know, so it started from there and it, and it really um, increased, uh, that interest increased when I came here. Did uh, you ask country. why a lot? <laughs> I did. I why? did. Why? Right. <laughs> I, yeah, I did. And there, and there's also a lot of self-reflection involved. Mm-hmm. You know, trying to find out, okay, is this, yeah, is, is this something that it's innate in human beings or is this something that is learned? Mm-hmm. And very early on, I started asking those two questions, and I haven't got an answer yet. <laughs> <laughs> Still searching, right? I'm still looking. That's right. That scientist is always asking questions and searching. It's a beautiful thing. Absolutely. Yeah. So, when you were going through your psychology uh, bachelor's, did you know which direction you wanted to go? Uh, well, I know that I wanted to do something in, in social science because people in, and uh, societies and history uh, always have fascinated me. So I, I knew that it, there was, um, I, I was going to be a social scientist. I just didn't know what kind. And I decided for psychology the last possible minute that I, that I could. It was the last class that I took as part of um, uh, my decision to to be in psychology or not. Psychology was the last class because I knew I was going to love it, and I did. And I never l- looked back, really. That's great. Yeah. It, it, isn't that beautiful? And it finally clicks in. You're looking, you're like, okay, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and then all of a sudden, just bam, it just kind of lands in your lap and you're like, ah, this is what I want to do. This is where I want to concentrate my energies and really mm-hmm. push forward. Oh, and absolutely. And once you find that out, then um, it, there's a lot of work involved, a lot of uh, tireless nights of uh, doing homework, but ultimately uh, you have that feeling that you are where you're supposed to be. Mm-hmm. And you keep on going. That's it, great. It feels, it feels right. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's a great feeling. Where would you like to go with doing Hispanic research and therapy and or where have you been doing it? That That's probably a better question, right? Where, where have you been? Where do you want to go? Well, um, I, will, um, I have always expressed interest for uh, bilingual uh, individuals, not only bilingual, but trilingual, multilingual. And how they process information, and how that information, how they uh, those thoughts are transferred into behavior, how are they affecting the individual? Uh, being from two different different cultures, having two different languages, two sets of data in their brains, you know, two sets of mental dictionaries uh, where they can draw from, and how that affects their behavior. Um, not only in the cognitive process, meaning in, in terms of reaction times, how how fast you process one language uh, versus another, but how th- not only the that cognitive process, but also how it behave, how it, it reflects on the behavior of the person. Mm-hmm. You know? And if there is a zero correlation between those two, the behavior itself itself. And the level of processing information, 
uh, in different languages. In this case, I did I studied uh, Spanish and English uh, speakers, and also uh, Chinese and English wow. speakers too. Mm-hmm. Oh, Chinese! Now that is that a difficult language. Yeah, yeah, learn. absolutely. But in terms of in, in terms of level of the processing, uh, all languages behave the same. They go, really go up, bottom up, and and then they get to that uh, mental dictionary, and then they go up to the uh, higher processes or the higher the higher pro- cognitive processes of the, of the brain, and then comes back again. Right. So uh, the processing itself is it's the same, even though the languages are different. Yeah. So do you do you find that you have two sets of dictionaries in your head also, still? Oh, absolutely. And when one fails, I draw from the other. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, because I can imagine that you know, for some words, you just mm-hmm. there's not. An equivalent in another language, and yeah. you're kind of tongue tied and going, "Okay, how do I explain what I'm <laughs> thinking about?" And excuse me for a minute, but I've got to figure the 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 correct word here. I I've, I I have several yeah. friends that are are bilingual Spanish English or German English, yeah. and they're just <laughs> like one of my friends said, my translator tubes are crossed, and I can't figure out how to say this in English anymore. So. You know, so it's just a, a matter of, of patience. Right. And, uh, and especially, it's especially true in the case of where a, 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 a word has such a strong meaning in that language. Yes. And it cannot be just, it cannot be translated into your own. It holds its own. And that's uh, one of the interesting things about balance, balanced bilinguals or people who are most of the time have the same level of proficiency in both languages. Uh, see, sometimes they cannot translate stuff because it's unique to the language, unique to the culture. Yes. And um, we try to justify it and give it meaning by using different words often, often uh, than just one word. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's really difficult. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, it happens to me all the time. I wish I wish eventually they would just come up with a universal language. Maybe take a few words from one language, a few words from another language, just all mesh them up, and then eventually everybody's going to learn that <laughs> language, and everybody can finally talk to each other. That right. would be that would be phenomenal. Maybe we should start that. Yeah, called the Babylon Project. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right. The birth of a new language All here. All right, let's do it. All right. <laughs> so we are going to take a commercial break, and we will be right back with Psych One on One. Are you searching for answers and insight to life issues? Is the behavior of family or friends questionable or concerning? Find tips and possible solutions from the convenience of your own PC, cell phone, or tablet at therapycable.com. Therapy Cable has the most comprehensive library of contemporary therapy videos online. Help may be as easy as a few clicks away. Therapy Cable offers comprehensive therapy videos ranging from addiction to self-care and contact information for qualified providers. Find the answers to your life challenges at therapycable.com. Hi, we're back with Psych One on One. This is Julianne Good, and I've got Jose Trujillo with me. We are talking about Hispanic mental health this evening. Mm-hmm. And with your research, Jose, what's one of the more fascinating topics within Hispanic mental health that, that you came across? Well, in my own research, it, it started very uh, cognitive, uh, cognitive uh, science like. So, uh, we really wanted to hit on uh, the scientific differences between um, um, bilinguals, uh, monolinguals and bilinguals, and then uh, move on from there to a more um, to other extensions of the same uh, sort of topic in going into culture. So there is difference between the cultures. We wanted to really start from a, a basic quantitative point. And then go from there and see and, and uh, evolve into culture and evolve into community and see if there was a relationship between 
uh, the basic premise of um, uh, comparing monolinguals or bilinguals and then moving on to to uh, a, a larger context. So we started by just testing um, basic, for example, reaction times of bilinguals and monolinguals. And we found that uh, bilinguals often um, lag in uh, compared to monolinguals. So their reaction times are slower. Now, when we say that, we're not talking about two or three seconds below. <laughs> we're talking about a fraction, a 1,000th fraction of a second. You can uh, barely notice it unless you're testing it out, <laughs> right? Absolutely, yeah. and that's what we did. We put people in, in the lab right in front of um, a screen and we measured reaction times. Um, and, and we did find there was um, a, a sm very, very small um, difference in terms of how uh, monolinguals and bilinguals process information. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the good news for uh, bilinguals is that they had higher ratings of associa association, mm -hmm. meaning that they could draw from different um, from different uh, parts. We're talking about this mental uh, lexicons that people have. They could draw and make associations faster than monolinguals. So their association scales uh, were off the roof, you know, their scores, um, but not in terms of the reaction times. And one, um, one explanation could be that uh, bilinguals process information mm, through a parallel process. And the two different languages are in, at different times moving at the same speed. Mm -hmm. So that uh, if you're in, if you know anything about computers if you've got two or three different programs running at the same time it's going to slow down your computer mm -hmm. it's the same deal with uh with bilinguals especially if they're dealing with three languages or more right i can imagine yeah, yeah. yeah. okay so taking it from the lab into the home and households um hispanic households that have several, uh, maybe two or three generations living in them. The older generation is monolingual. Right. And the younger generation may also be monolingual, but only in English. I, right. I've known people that have grown up in households like that. And I can only imagine the, the difficulty of trying to communicate within family members who only know one language each right? versus bilingual. I mean, is there any way of, of communicating within the family members in a household like that? Yeah, and, and historically, this is not new. Um, second generation, they start to lose the language more, and then the third generation start even um, lose uh, the, uh, the grandparents' uh, uh, tongue, the uh, grandparents' language also uh, becomes almost extinct unless there's uh, children are constantly um, being um, being communicated with uh, with Spanish English or whatever other language you may speak at home so uh, what we found was that there was um, a lack of communication between the first and the third generation mm -hmm. so um, there was communic there is communication there was communication but is uh, most of the time uh, what we found in in parent hispanic um, households was that the uh, parents were speaking to the children in spanish mm -hmm. children were uh were talking back or communicating to the parents in english mm. so if uh, the great mediator could be the parents. So if the parents um, enforce Spanish in their households, then um, uh, then the, the third generation, the, what we're talking about, they'll grow up m most of the time bilingual. Mm -hmm. you know? But if, we, uh, if they don't enforce Spanish in their households, then um, they'll become more acculturated into, uh, into society, uh, and then um, 
uh, language as part of culturation, and they would um, they would not uh, translate that to their kids. Mm-hmm. So um, so communication is really important, but uh, by the third or fourth generation, um, then communication sometimes is lost because parents cannot speak to their to their grandchildren anymore. Grandchildren cannot speak to their parents. Right. Or their grandparents and so on. Yeah, and, and, and translating over into behavioral issues. I mean, what what would transpire out of that? I would imagine there would be a lot of uh, just being, you know... Yeah. Be tense yeah. about it. Being, you know, I don't know how to talk to you, and this is really important that we communicate. We're living in the same household. Yeah. So, what what kind of behavioral issues do you see in in households like that? Yeah, um, there are definitely uh, behavioral issues uh, in many of those households when where this happens, um, because um, the way that society transfers, they, we have rituals, we have things. For example, in uh, in my own, um, have a cousin had a quinceañera, which is like fifteen, uh, fifteen uh, birthday party for for girls. It's sort of a ritual of passage mm-hmm. among girls, and that was really important. But um, I remember uh, that uh, when we went to the party, um, everything was English. You know, because that's what she wanted. In nothing about Hispanic culture, or <clears throat> or anything related to the language, um, uh, the language in Spanish. No music in Spanish, so everything was done um, f- by the teenage teenage wishes, and everything was rap and <laughs> English. And which I'm um, sure the parents and the grandparents were just thrilled about. Oh, right? they, they were just absolutely. Um, thrilled but you know it's a girl okay let's do whatever she wants uh-huh. it's her day um so that's a prime example of how um that translates into uh into the acculturation process uh in terms of um behavior well then when this 15 year old grows up she's going to try and f- transfer the culture that she wants to um to her children and so even within one or two generations we, we lost that communication between old and young and it's so important to have that link that connection yeah is um you just sometimes people feel when they come here or when they're born here and they lose that language that um <clears throat> there's no point of reference sometimes and there's Issues of identity, mm-hmm. uh, problems with identity, problems with depression, problems with uh, different behavioral problems, especially in adolescence. Because they need that connection to the past, and sometimes they lose it because of the language and then barrier. They, they also lose the beauty of the customs <laughs> and the closeness of the tight knit family because I would imagine families are, are closer. In Mexico than they are here once they become acculturated to more American styles of individuality. Absolutely. And of course, um, this is my opinion in my own experience, and I just ha- happen to agree with that statement. Absolutely. Yeah, and that can that can cause some r- a lot of problems. I mean, not only in the home, but in <clears throat> schools, in work, you know, um, I was reading the story of this one young man that was trying to make it in the American culture of, you know, I've got to go and push it and individuality, dog eat dog. I've got this mentality now Mm -hmm. of trying to make it in America, Mm -hmm. but then turning around and then his grandmother was slighted because he wasn't coming over and visiting her anymore or as much. And she felt like she had had loss of the family, loss of that deep connection that she used to feel. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. And that happens more often um, than we'd like to. Um, but it, it's it's part of 
is part of becoming acculturated, I think, in this society. Yeah, so yeah. when we come back from the music break, let's talk about different forms of acculturation within America, within the Hispanic culture. Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. Okay, right, we'll do that. we're going to take a little break. Welcome back to Psych 101. This is Julianne Good, and I'm with Jose Trujillo. We are talking about Hispanic mental health. And before the break, we were talking about situations with acculturation when uh, Hispanic people move into the United States and the good and the bad of it and what a transition it is moving into this culture of individualization versus being more of a um, family-oriented culture. So, Jose, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. And especially if we were talking about marriage, for example, we ha had, um, after all, growing up in Mexico, had a very uh, specific idea of what marriage should be and what marriage is. Um, I view it as the... Um, the the main source of um, uh, where people go to feel loved and secure, uh, to feel that uh, they matter in that inner circle, uh, very important. In fact, and uh, the place where I was born, uh, there were a lot of uh, people named uh, Jose, or Joseph, Maria. Mary and Jesus, and that's Jesus. So we have the whole uh, sacred family going on. Uh, everyone had a first name, Jose, Maria, or Jesus, and then they had their real uh, uh, name, the middle name. Um, so um, the family structure, the marriage uh, was sacred, I remember, and um, very uh, strong meaning that uh, they developed a really strong support system. Now, when I came here, I was really surprised by the culture of individual individualism and um, doing what is best for you, and second is everybody else. Mm -hmm. Well, um, um, when I was young, about uh, when I was about 20 or so, I decided to get married. Didn't go so well, <laughs> especially with uh, the ideas um, that have been embedded in me for such a long time. Oh, what about uh, of what a marriage should be? Well, it ended about uh, about five years later. It ended, and um, I was just I remember like being on a sitting down on a side on a sidewalk and just putting my head my my hands over my head and 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 asking myself well what happened 
you know and it was that i was perplexed by um uh, the divorce and and um, the idea that i had in my head was so different from the reality i was experiencing at the time and i think this um of course it's an opinion but uh i i have talked to people who have been through similar situations and uh, they say the same thing oh yeah what happened you know i was fine one day and then the next day um it was just hell broke loose and uh, we're divorced one of the things that i have found uh, to be uh, sort of an overlapping theme is the um the this idea of social networks mm-hmm. this thing that we didn't have before you know um what do people do when they got angry at each other um in in even in mexico or in older um in older generations well you talk to your mom you talk to your dad or you talk to anybody a uh, close friend and then they most of the time they maybe would advise you to think about it and then go back to your spouse mm-hmm. but nowadays you uh, have a fight with someone or you break up and there's 10 other guys on the sidelines waiting for a text or for an, an update on your facebook status that says mm-hmm. single instead of in a relationship or whatever right you know so there are so many other variables involved now in marriage and having kids and um many of my acquaintances and friends have expressed and, and many of them are uh, latino mm-hmm. uh, especially mexican americans and they have expressed you know i'm done i prefer to stay single uh, uh and of course the grandmothers are just shouting at them and uh, because they want uh, grandchildren you know they want to continue that tradition and then, so they decide not they're deciding more and more not to get married not to have kids and he, and this is completely opposite to the idea that we had when we, when we first came to this country you know is it, it you know, I had to do a, a total 180 of uh your thinking and you, your acculturation um the different ideas that you grew up with and, and then turning that on his head right and then questioning the whole process it's like okay i'm not happy in this marriage so what else is there especially since you were 25 Absolutely. i know when when i got divorced i was i was you know at early 30s and i was kind of like Okay, now what? Because I think it's the whole thing too. And in the younger generations now, it's like, okay, I want to do this. My my family would be happy if I went and got married and you know, and and built that family, built that lineage. And sometimes that's just not a reality. And the whole thing is too, it's faster-paced living up here. And and um the traditions just don't hold anymore it's like what are traditions anymore i mean yeah. it's interesting to see uh the the 20 somethings that their parents and grandparents may have passed on something to them but it it's not as significant of history it's kind of like oh well that's interesting we'll just pass it on you know it's not not quite words of wisdom yet right but, but we so still ev- ha- everything's kind of being put into question now right well people are still getting married um, yes oh yeah because of the hope because of seeing their grandparents parents be together after 50 years mm-hmm. right. they want that people want that uh, especially if you grew up in a culture where that is so important um, but then again um they sometimes they are up to a very rude awakening when that doesn't happen because we live in a very different society mm-hmm. that um, that with their parents you know um, very fast paced often a mother and father work so who takes care of the children right you know? so um very very different culture i mean 
remember in Mexico, um, my grandfather always come after work and my grandmother had eight kids and she stayed at home mm -hmm. raising them. Well, now who raises our kids? You know, it's... Uh, Babysitters during the day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> at least $75 a week. Yeah. <laughs> and the schools. And then, you know, there, there you go. It's, you know, the whole situation, too, with the schools. You know, I, the acculturation again, it's depending on the school district that your child is in. Yes. If your child goes in only speaking Spanish, really difficult. I mean, how, how did you learn <laughs> English? How did you come in and just deal well, with the school system? I would find that fascinating. <laughs> the w I've, I learned English the, the same way that my friends learned, learned English by not talking to each other and talk and just turning on the TV. Mm -hmm. I learned English literally from um, the TV, TV shows and music and music videos and things that I was into and I wanted to learn. So I learned the lyrics, for example, of, of song. So a lot of swear words up front, right? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Well, interestingly, the first song that I ever learned in English was... Um, um, a song by Foreigner. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I, I want to know what love is. Oh, well, that's a good song. That, that, that's a nice song to start learning English to, at least. Oh, you know, that's positive. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, uh, I had very fantastic teachers uh, in high school, although I was uh, depressed and... Um, and mad because I was in another country that I knew what I didn't want to go to. I was 15. But uh, I had really amazing teachers who taught me grammar very well, um, who uh, went to trips um, to different places and learned things real by touching them, by going into the zoo and saying, this is a bear, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> So I actually seeing the thing. I I, I re, I'm really thankful for uh, for for the teachers in high school. Um, although uh, I I learned English by of course by their teachings. And and if I ask my friends, I the other day I asked my friend, okay, how do, how do we learn English? And he said, I have no idea because we never spoke English with each other where whenever we were as um, you know people who came from the same place mm -hmm. or whatever we always spoke Spanish never a word of English mm -hmm. and I was uh, I was just amazes me that uh, we learned so much and that tells you about the um, the plasticity of the brain mm -hmm. right. and your tenacity too <laughs> to want to learn you know, and and be bilingual, you know, and you do, you you, you, you do a phenomenal job. I I love talking to you. I when you told me your story initially at school, I was going, wow, this is this is awesome. I you know, yeah. you're an American success story from from the traditional sense of when when people were you know yeah. that that's the way that this country was started with immigrants. I really absolutely love this country and the opportunities that it's given. Yeah. Absolutely. Love yeah. it. I love it. I don't know. I'm really thinking about it. I just don't know what other country would be best um, for me. I, I, ju I just can't imagine myself being somewhere else. You know, I've been here 20 years now. Well, yeah. go check out Europe sometime, too. <laughs> <laughs> hey. We're talking Sigmund about Freud it. Freud University, right? Vienna. Let's go. <laughs> Let's party. Hint, Let's hint. Paint. Yeah, that's right. Let's paint the town with psychology. Yeah, there you go. From one end of the globe to the other. That's right. <laughs> You're ready. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So as we're starting to wrap up mm -hmm. some of the um, psychological issues about doing counseling mm -hmm. with Hispanics, what, mm -hmm. what do you think is really important when d dealing with with family issues well um from 
speaking to a, a lot of my friends who have um, become uh, social scientists and some of them counselors, mm. that uh, um, when dealing, especially with with, with immigrants, um, don't go directly to the point. Don't go directly into the business side of uh, counseling. Don't ask any direct questions. You gotta have, you gotta make people comfortable. Mm -hmm. Uh, ask about um, very different things, uh, hobbies, things like that, to get people comfortable. And then once they open up, they open up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they open up, and um, and maybe you won't be able to really shut them up wow. <laughs> after a while. <laughs> and how about when dealing with a family, um, addressing the father? or the husband first? How important mm -hmm. is that? Well, it varies from household to household. It varies from what type of culture this person is from. Um, you, they varies from what town, varies from what uh, city. So it is to the best interest of the counselor to find out first before seeing the client uh, where exactly um, the client is from. Mm -hmm. um, now, more most of the time in Mexico, it is still a patriarchal society. Um, however, um, the real power um, that in Mexican society, I think, are women because they maintain uh, the household. They uh, take care of everything when uh, the parent, uh, the, the father is out working. Mm -hmm. See, so there is a. Um, I would say a devotion for the mother figure, mm -hmm. you know, and and there's also a sort of a uh, uh, respect for the father figure. So they deal. Um, people often deal with their mom and dad in very different ways in Mexico, and so that's an important that's important information to have if you're a counselor. Mm -hmm. If you uh, are training uh, an individual or a family or uh, children of that kind of family, you know, uh, you definitely want to do your background check mm -hmm. before uh, before starting the session. Right, yeah. and then ask the questions and and come across as being warm and caring. Oh yeah, know? absolutely. Um, the one thing that I found um, uh, cou counselors have told me is that once the, uh, the client is um, um, at ease with you, once that you, they see that you're generous and honest, um, they're very, very loyal. Mm -hmm. So they stay with you um, for sometimes for a lifetime. That's wonderful. Yeah. And you're part of the family too. And, and sort of a way because, you know, um, I have very close friends who are Hispanic and every time mm -hmm. I go over there, it's like, you know, it's their house is my house and, <laughs> yeah. and it's like, come on in, it's like join we, us. We very, <laughs> That's I think, beautiful. Like overall, very, very welcoming. Um, but then I, again, it, it just, um, it's part of it. It's part of, um, keeping people in the, in the circle, mm -hmm. you know, uh, so, yeah. And of course, um, in, in the, uh, in the culture books, I've, I've read very different, uh, stories about the differences or similarities between Latino and Hispanic and Central American and Mexican American. Um, all of these different definitions that uh, books have mm -hmm. um, and how they overlap sometimes, but often they don't, they don't agree with each other. So ultimately, it's very important to tell the client or to ask the client, how, how do you want to be referred as? Mm -hmm. you know, um, a lot of um, Mexican-Americans Ameri Mexican that I know don't want to be called Hispanics, mm -hmm. you know. It's a very general term, and it pertains to people from Spain. Um, other uh, people prefer Latinos. Um, I think again, Brazil is in 
Latin America and they don't speak Spanish. So I know it's so it's so many variations, and yeah. I know we all. And I'm sorry, I just kind of had to put the um, umbrella at you know just using the term Hispanics. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's it, it it's difficult, but there are it's, you know many variations, yeah. and, and beautiful and similarities and differences, and that makes us mm. just it you know again as being social scientists that that just locks us into we're fascinated by behavior no matter what culture you're from it's beautiful it's always something to discover about who whoever's in front of you you know it's a it's a new package it's a new present so it's beautiful and that present is ever changing it is yeah so it you is. don't have to you know Give it back to Macy's or whatever. You, you keep that gift, and it's a gift, gift that keeps on giving. Yes, it, it is. changes every time. You look at human behavior today, look at human behavior tomorrow, you will never get bored. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So keep your eyes open, keep your mind open, and uh, ask questions and, and get to know the person in front of you. You know, they have something to yeah. I- enrich your life and vice versa. So, you know, just be open to the experience. So, Jose, if anybody wants to contact you, how can they do so? Well, um, my uh, email address, can I give my Oh, yeah, of course, address? definitely. My email address is uh, from the university. I'm going to use the university email address. If that's mm-hmm. okay. Sure. This is JC, uh, my last name, Trujillo. It's JC, T R U J I. L-L-O at argc.edu. And he's a librarian over at the Orange County campus. That's and right. we enjoy you being there. You're very knowledgeable about whatever's going on in the library and trying to find information. And Yeah, absolutely. My title is um, learner, uh, learner Support Specialist, and I absolutely love that title. Um, I really didn't like it at first, so... <laughs> librarian will be best but uh, as I uh, uh, grow grew into the role I, I really I, I really think that it's it, that's what I do I support students the best that I can uh, in various topics not only in research and APA and how to write uh, uh, psychology papers but also in terms of um, helping them with mathematics and and helping uh, them with technology. So my job is very versatile, and I absolutely love it. And you're very good at it, and you're a man that wears many, many hats, which we appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> and you never get bored, right? Never. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to be bored? <laughs> uh, absolutely. <laughs> So, uh, is there any words of wisdom you'd like to part with? Well, um, um, I I don't know. I'm I'm nobody. It's it's like the more it's like Socrates uh, said, the more I know, uh, the less I think I know, or <laughs> something like that. <laughs> it's meaning that there's uh, always something to learn from somebody. Right. You know, don't close your eyes. Open your eyes to the possibility of human connection. You know, um, um, sometimes I know we're busy, um, but uh, sometimes it's just good to stop and actually focus on something. Yeah. So today um, I walked as I was walking to the studio. Uh, there is a lot of uh, things going on downtown, as you saw. Yes. Many sirens going people walking up and down. I decided to, as I was walking to the studio, to focus on a tree. So I was walking by the side and I was just focusing on that tree. And that really made a difference for me. It it refocused my day. It made me feel calm, made me feel relaxed, made me look at the details of the environment. And sometimes we lose that. We lose that as we uh, run from one place to another. I agree. Thank you so much, Jose. You were wonderful. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you. And thank you, listeners, so much for tuning in to Psych One-on-One. I'm on every Monday night between 7 and 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Also archived on iTunes under the podcast section at skidrowstudios.com and at therapycable.com. So check out the other programs that I've done before, and uh, there's a lot of self-help programs that you can tune into anytime. If you want to contact me, my business number is 562-234-4650, and my email is jgoode8 at verizon.net. Thank you so much for tuning in again to Psych 101. This is Julianne Good. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. Bye now.